Welcome to the Hard Won Wisdom Podcast with best-selling author, Vaughn Germer and corporate innovator, Michelle Brigman. Come here weekly for career and life-changing conversations with some of today's most influential thought leaders, senior executives, and trailblazers who will share their mentoring wisdom. This podcast is brought to you by the Women's Leadership Network. Hi, I'm Fawn Germer. And I'm Michelle Brigman. And this is the Hard One Wisdom Podcast. This season, we've been talking a lot about how we settle for less in relationships, careers, in our lives. And today we are joined by Elizabeth Haney, an Asheville psychotherapist, who says that there are actually times when we should settle. I found her through her many great articles in Psychology Today, including the one where she asked, is settling always bad? So welcome. Thanks for coming here to give us a great new perspective on this. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah, I really liked when I wrote you. I was telling you what we were doing because I just always tell people, never settle, never settle. And you're like, wait a minute. Yeah, I remember writing you back and saying, if you want a guest who's saying never settled, I'm not the right person and that's fine. It's just not you know, where I come from. And uh, I used to go back and say, that's even better. <laughs> so right. I thought, okay. Yeah. yeah. So tell me, when is it good to settle? So, you know, I'm a therapist, so I think of things a little bit differently. I feel like there's an internal wisdom we want to pay attention to. And that sometimes that wisdom is going to tell us to hold out, go for it, really strive, whatever. And sometimes that wisdom is going to say, time to let go, drop the rope, step back. And so I don't want to have it in my head that I should always be driving forward or striving or reaching for my dream or something like that. That's a great thing to do. And I'm not, I'm not saying anything negative about it. I just don't want to have the idea that that's the thing to do. Because what that means is then I won't hear that wisdom that sometimes says time to step back you know, time to settle. And I don't know how often in anyone's life it says one thing or the other. I'm more about helping people listen to what that internal wisdom is saying. And if I think that I'm supposed to be always striving and never settling, it it's going to make it hard for me to really hear that, to be honest with you. I don't know that we're saying anything different. And, and that's interesting because several years ago, there was that book, Lean In. And that's all you heard was lean in, lean in, lean in, yeah. lean in. And I was always the biggest proponent of lean out. You know, yeah. it's like you don't have to have that in your career. But if you are consciously saying that's not for me, it sounds to me like that's not settling. Right. It's it's making a conscious choice of where your boundaries are and what you want in your life, and that you might not want to play by the rules that other people set. Yeah, I think that's absolutely right. You know, I was thinking as I was, uh, as I was just kind of considering things and talking to you two, I thought, you know, if we're not careful, and we have that rule about I should never settle, it can get us into a situation where it's like we're pushing on a door that says pull on it, <laughs> you know? And we're pushing and we're pushing and we're pushing and we're, and we're not reading that little sign next to the door because we're so dedicated to like, I'm going to make, I'm, I'm going to, you know, reach this goal or this dream or something like that. But there might be that little sign that says pull. And I think sometimes settling can be the pull part, you know? <clears throat> I, I look at settling as when you make peace with something that does not make you happy. Yeah, well, I, <laughs> sorry, bring it, just bring it. Yeah, we won't hear uh, yeah, that. yeah. I yeah. mean, I want to learn how to be very skilled at being happy and unhappy, you know, because I think both are going to come my way. And so I want, I don't want my happiness to depend on something external. Like if I get that job, if I have this bank account, if I, then I'm going to be happy. I want my happiness to be more internally driven. And maybe that means I'm not going to make money or get that job or something like that. I still want to be happy. So I want to be really careful. And again, this is an internal thing I'm talking about. I want to be really careful not to set myself up to think, going to be happy when I achieve this thing. I mean, 
that may be true, but I could be miserable when I achieve it, or I could be just as happy when I settle and I don't achieve it. So to me, all of that is about staying very open and flexible in myself. Um, you know, I, 12 step meetings have a, a phrase a friend of mine told me one time, um, you got to do life on life's terms, not on your terms. And I really love that because I feel like life's going to come at me. It's going to bring me happiness and unhappiness, achievement and failure, um, striving and settling. It's going to, it's going to bring all of that at me. And I want to find my own sense of, I don't know, fulfillment or pride or pleasure, no, no matter which way we're working. Right. So if, again, if I set myself up to think I should never settle, I'm, I'm, I, I think I'm making it hard on myself. You know, I think it means I'm only going to be happy if I achieve this. And but I, I think just, you're only hearing us in terms of achievement. I'm talking about you're in a relationship where you're not happy. You're living in a place where you're not happy. Okay. You're not, you may be in a situation where you're required to be a workaholic and you're not happy. And I, I believe happiness is now and that you don't get happy as soon as you just find a way. Yeah. That's not settling. That's, that's boundaries. Yeah. So I hear that. So this is kind of what I'm hearing. Yeah. I'm hearing this definition of settling being, um, against, I'm going to use the word societal definition. And whereas we do what is, you know, what we're told to do, what we've been taught to do, what we've seen others do. Well, and that going against what's maybe intuitively right for us, then that isn't the right answer. But I think we're all coming about the same thing because I think ultimately what I'm hearing is your your compass is your intuition, that's your right. feeling of peace. So as long as you're letting that be what points you in the direction, then yeah. you're not settling. No matter what the details or the again the the topic is. Yeah. It's always tuning into self and that voice and us learning how to be mindful and listen and hear what it's telling us versus letting all the other external things override. And I think that sometimes we get in that settling thing where people get, they're involved with somebody, the wrong person, definitely the wrong person for them. And then they tell themselves, well, the devil you know is better than the devil you don't. <laughs> or, you know, I've, I just got to get the kids through the next four years and then I'm going to think about it. And, you know, and that may be a decision that they need to make and, and choose to make. But I see people who dig in for the long haul on things that have consistently made them unhappy. When I, I left a job years ago and someone had been there for 20 years and she said, I had been unhappy here for 18 years. But, you know, it pays well, it's union protected, and I get to live in Colorado. It's like, why would you give up 18 years of your life for that when there might be a way to find something else that pays well, you know, lets you live in a good place? And then, you know, in marriages, oh, my God, the people who are so afraid to, to believe that they will find love again or that if they don't, they'll be fine, that's... That's settling, and that's sad. Yeah, I think that um, I was thinking about, I had a conversation with a friend of mine a couple of weeks ago. He's been married 15 years, and he said, oh, my wife and I had this really intense conversation. I said, what was that? And she's, he said, well, um, we talked about our disappointment in our marriage, the disappointments we'll have to live with. And I said, oh, you know, it's like, he said, I feel like we're reckoning with the other person isn't going to be this perfect person or perfect partner or something like that, you know? And I thought, what an interesting way to just talk openly about that. I'm not saying that that was a, a conversation about settling, but I felt like it was a conversation about reckoning with, you know, what you had hoped for versus what you got, right? And I thought, what a... I don't know, spectacularly healthy conversation to well, have. I think so, because I, there, there are, we all know a few really fabulous relationships, but there are a lot that are more, you know, a B or a C on the yeah. grading scale. And that's, that's a couple choosing to make it work. That's right. Standing that that's what they've got. 
That's right. Yeah. But, you know, what and I about- think when you're talking about people who stay in relationships or jobs long term, you know, what I think, Ron, is that we're actually talking more about fear or anxiety than settling. Do you think? Like they're afraid to risk stepping away or. Yeah, well, that might be the the root, but it is, I think it, that's the root, but it is kind of settling saying, well, you know, it, it, I, I have a union protected job that pays me well. And yeah, you do have the fear of stepping out and, and am I good enough to get something else? That's definitely playing into it. But it's also, it's a conscious decision to say, I, I'm settling for this. Yeah. And then I, I see people who are in relationships that are very controlling or emotionally abusive. Um, I judge that, you know, somebody who's in a, a domestic violence situation, I don't judge that at all because, you know, and you know this, that, you know, they kind of wind up in that and that's got its own pathology and I don't judge it. I just hope if anyone's listening, who's got that understands that there are resources, but for those relationships that are unfulfilling you, know, some, you stay like, for oh, the kids. You feel yeah. like again, it's that pressure of feeling like mm. that if you if you step outside of the acceptable behavior, yeah, not not wise. That's a bad choice. Or what about so, the relationship that goes on for years, and the sex sucks, <laughs> or <laughs> it never happens. It didn't happen, right? And and you stay. I mean, well, I haven't stayed for that, but, you know, I mean, we were talking about somebody over the weekend. You know, I think people stayed for a lot of different reasons, but yeah. maybe they also don't realize that they can have more. And maybe even that they can have more in that relationship if they had the courage, you know, to, I don't know, go talk to someone or bring it up or put their foot down or say, you know, this isn't working for me. What are we going to do? Or like. You know, that's a that's a big sort of crossroads or choice point there about when do you give up on yourself versus standing up and saying, this has to change. Like, this doesn't work for me. Isn't that the crux of all of it, though? Even if yeah. it's your job and you're yeah. in a, because, you know, I think your relationship with your job is very similar sometimes to relationships that you have in your real life. So you can yeah. have an emotionally abusive boss. You can work for a company that is abusive yeah. and you, it's those moments when you lose bit by bit, those pieces of yourself yeah, right. that cause you to settle for less than you deserve and could have. Yeah. Or it's easier to leave it's easy. or stay versus <laughs> what you just said, Elizabeth, and that is having the conversation that needs to be had. I will avoid the conversation and I will disrupt everything instead now we do that all the time and you know about half of my practice is working with couples so i this is something i encounter a lot where i'll talk to couples who have not had the conversations they needed to have for like decades right they have not admitted to each other or to themselves yeah neither one of us like we're living without sex we're living without intimacy forget the sex we're living without fondness we're living without closeness but if they don't if they aren't willing to engage with that and face it and hopefully reckon with it you're right they're just settling for something else that i think they might have the power to change they may not have to leave the relationship i work with a lot of people and we sort of dismantle the dynamics well, and put it back together differently um but it takes courage to even step up to that, doesn't it? Because maybe yeah. you have to admit that you're that's it doing something that, you know, you yeah. don't want to admit wrongdoing, right? It's easier. You didn't want to. Well, I was telling Michelle about someone I know who had numerous affairs because Where's... she could not stand how her husband kissed. He kissed very sloppily. And I'm like, why don't you tell him how to kiss you? Oh, I can. He would be horrified. I think well, you think he would rather you be having sex with other people because he can't. But that's a really good 
question. So if something is salvageable through a conversation, how do you have a conversation that should have happened years ago? Yeah. Who's going to have the courage? You know, if I'm working with both people, I, I'm watching it happen. I'm thinking, who's going to have the courage to speak up about what's underneath the story they're telling me, right? We, they have the story, you know, but then all the stuff that's underneath the story about the relationship, who's going to speak up first? Who's going to have the courage to say the thing that has not gotten said? Like, I can't stand the way you kiss me. I don't know if I would want them to say it like that, but, you know, to say, hey, we need to talk. You know, I've got a problem here that I've actually never talked to you about. I, I apologize for that. And let's see if we can uh, do something different here. And I'm afraid you're going to feel this and this or it's, a, you know, you're going to be offended. But I really want to work it through with you. You know, like, again, a lot of courage to just speak up because you don't know what's going to happen. But I'd rather help people learn to tolerate that I don't know what's going to happen part than to stay boxed up in the little part that they know, right? Yeah. And maybe that's related to settling. I'll, I'll stay boxed up in the little part that I know it because will... it's too scary to open it up and not really know where it's going to go. I think life is a lot happier when we're opened up, you know? So give you had some examples of some people who waited and waited and finally had that terribly uncomfortable conversation. Does it work well? How do they do it? Yeah. So, so like I said, somebody has to take that first step. And if if they're working with me, I'm watching how it lands on the other side, because that's big, you know, to say something like, I don't like how you kiss me. So I want to work also on helping the person like receive that mm -hmm. and try to find the value in it and also deal with how devastating it might be to hear something like that, because, you know, of course. But can we have a, can we build a relationship where sometimes we say devastating things to each other and we learn how to repair that and how to move through it and maybe even get closer from it, right? Rather than, oh, no, we don't talk about that. It's like, can we actually talk about it? And can I know it's going to hurt you? And no, can we, can we build a relationship where I trust we'll figure that out, right? And sometimes, by the way, you're going to say something that hurts me. And that's part of the deal. We're either going to have an honest, connected relationship or we're not. And if it's honest, sometimes we're going to be saying things to each other that are painful or hurtful. That's, that's just how it is. So I'm trying to, you know, I think of it, one of, the, one of the, my mentors used to talk about um, doing things like that develops emotional maturity. You know, like you, t you learn to tolerate the things that you've been telling yourself are intolerable, Right. And that in itself develops some emotional maturity where you learn like, oh, I can say the hard things or I can do difficult things or I can face you when I don't want to. But you have to, it's not theoretical. It's not like I can convince you of that. You actually have to walk that road and learn that. And I do think sometimes people settle because they're too afraid to walk that, you know, those next five steps, you know? Because you are giving up some control. There's a lot of control in settling. We don't think of it that way, but I see it that way as it's playing out. There's a lot of control in staying in that job. There's a lot of control in never speaking up about your relationship, right? Why? You have just, you know, kept the, the definition. The illusion of the control, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So for those of us who did not witness these healthy conversations, yeah. like, yeah. Are there TV shows? Is there somewhere like it's, I hear what you're saying, but like, if I look around, I did not have examples of this. Right. Right. I had the what not to do, which of course goes into my toolkit, <laughs> what, what I practice. Right? But like, I have to consciously learn and go to therapy and I do all of those things. But I, do you see good examples that you could point to whenever oh. people are like, I don't even know how to do this. Oh, yeah. Oh, I mean, sit in my office with me for a couple of days. It's amazing what people can teach themselves to do. It's not quick. There's not like a little, you know, three steps. It is literally, I can remember, this is a relationship I was in back in my maybe late 20s. And I wasn't taught how to, like, be forthright either at all. And so, but I was in therapy. I'm becoming a therapist. I'm working on it myself. 
And I can remember standing in front of the person I was in a relationship with, and I stood there and I just said, I, I don't really know what to say right now. Like, <laughs> that was my intro, you know? And I thought, yay, that's one step further than I usually go, you know? And then I was like, but I need to say something about the such and such, whatever it was. And I thought, step two, you know, it's like literally, I don't care if I make a half an inch of progress, that's a half an inch, right? I, so that's one thing is like, I have to just open my mouth and try to say it, right? The second thing is I have to be willing to screw it all up. And I think too many people, if they make a change, they want to do it right. And I mean, I made a mess of things for probably a few years as I'm trying to teach myself how to be more forthright. I mean, really and truly, I, you know, said the wrong thing and said it in the wrong tone and got all, all tangled up and, you know, but I just kept thinking if I keep doing it, I'll get better at it, you know? Um, and so I think a lot of times in my practice, people want to know, like, what are the three, so how do I do that? And I'm like, well, you can just like, kind of, it's almost like, here's my analogy. It's like, you want to learn how to swim, right? But instead of getting in the water, you're walking around the pool, you're walking around the pool and you're looking at the water and you're thinking, I don't know. I mean, maybe if I did, maybe if I get in over here, but maybe I get in over it, but you've been walking around that pool for years. Get in the dang water, right? And then you're going to sink a little bit, but you'll figure out how to dog paddle and you'll figure out how to keep your head up. And, but you have to be in the water. And by that, I, I mean, you have analogy. to get yeah. the conversation. Like, yeah. stop. And so, you know, in the work that I do, clients often want to keep walking around the pool with me. You know, well, what about this? And what about, and I'm like, huh, yeah, we don't do that here. <laughs> Jumping in. I was, <laughs> last night, I was watching a, um, I was watching the TV series Friday Night Lights. Oh, you put the okay. So, so there was the couple between the coach and his wife. There was this moment where he didn't tell her that he was inviting like a hundred people over for a barbecue. Basically, I like gave her two days' notice. Right. So all these people show up. Of course, she didn't have enough food or whatever. So he's looking for her and he finds her under the table. Um, and he's like, "Would you get up here and start hosting this party for me? You know, I need your help." And she's like no right now i'm so pissed off at you and as long as i can be down here cleaning up this shit, they spilt the beer they made a mess you didn't give me any notice i do not want to get up and play hostess so whenever i feel like standing up and smiling i'll do that but until then i'm down here and so it's just this wonderful <laughs> like moment of the two of them i'm so mad at you like what are you Sorry. doing and then we're gonna beat a team at the end of it and i was like yeah. i just kind gotcha. of looked at it with new eyes i was like Love it. That's it. You have to go through the glitchy part, you know, where one map, why this? Well, da, 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 da. It's like, do that, do that part, and yeah. you'll find out how to get to the next part, right? Mm -hmm. But again, people step back, they stay back here on the part that they know, fine. and then they want to know fine. how to get up there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm okay. It's okay. And then inside, you want to punch them in the throat, and you never say it till it just builds up and that pressure. Yeah flies off the top right because yeah yeah and sometimes i'll say to somebody i don't want you to say i'm fine between now and the next session don't say it's it a one big time. deal do not take that off the table figure out how to say what's really going on do not say i'm fine or it's okay right just close but, that door and let's see where you go i don't know yeah yeah i would hate it but what that's percentage of those couples end up splitting up anyhow not that many. Really? Not that many. Because they see that in being more honest, literally more honest, they're building a completely different relationship. You know, and I'll, I, I said to somebody once, listen, you don't have to be honest with your wife. We can make her go away. We'll bring in the next four wives. This issue is going to come up for you about being honest rather than trying to be the good boy and the one who's you know, everything's fine and blah, blah, blah. So you can either do it now or you can do it with the next four, you know, whatever you want to do. But this is your issue. This is not about her, right? This is about you developing the skill of being so open and honest with the person you're involved with. That's a great skill to have. So whenever <laughs> you want to learn it, we can do that. But, you know. Well, what if 
the other person is a jerk because there are a lot of jerks out there. Yeah. So what do you do? How to, how to, so I tell the people how to graciously and directly address that, right? Knowing that you, maybe because you know them very well, you're not going to get like a breakthrough, right? In fact, maybe you're even going to get a blow up or something like that. But do you want to use this moment to teach yourself something about being more honest in a very direct and gracious way, right? Because you'll take that skill into the next relationship. You could practice it here, right? Rather than be afraid of, oh, you know, his or her upset, you could just say, listen, here's the bottom line for me, right? That's taking ownership and responsibility for your own growth, right? I'm I'm going to commit to evolving with or either we're going to do it together or it's whatever, but I'm going to commit to evolving. Yeah. I'm going to grow my skills and my emotional integrity. I don't know whether you're going to tolerate that. That's true for anybody I'm with I, for the rest of my life, right? I don't know whether they're going to tolerate that, but I that is who I am and I am committed to it. And I'm going to screw up as much as the next person. So we can do it here or we can change partners and do it next. I don't know. But I'm not going to keep myself smaller to try to hold on to a relationship. That's that's a dead Big in the statement. water proposition. Yeah. You know, there there's no vitality in that. Those are the people that show up in my office 12, 15 years later and say, we, we're just like roommates. We hardly ever talk. You know, and I'm thinking you didn't talk 15 years ago when this started, right? So true. And so you can you can take that risk, or you can shake hands and say goodbye, or you can stay in this pattern that you're in. Up to you. I never have an agenda. They get to decide what they want to do, but I want to make those choices very clear for them because they are huge choices. It changes who you are, right? It changes who you are to speak up. It changes who you are to be someone who settles, keeps your mouth shut. You get to choose who you want to be. Oh, I think there are a lot of situations where no conversation is going to fix it. Yeah, I, I agree. Mean, you know, you could How be with a narcissist. Happen? You could be with an, an alcoholic is a great example. Sure. It's like, you know, nothing sure. you say is going to do it. I agree. There, there are those situations. In fact, I... I tell people, I, I don't support anybody having an agenda that the other person will change, right? The only agenda is I'm going to change, right? I'm going to evolve. I'm going to make sure that I'm getting a deeper and deeper layer of emotional honesty and emotional integrity. I, I have no expectation of the other person. Yeah. Sometimes think- I'll say that's a, that's a sovereign human being over there that gets to make their choices. Right. So you don't get to have an agenda about how they would change, should change, but you can change yourself and see what happens. Yeah. I have a friend who really changed herself in that and in a sad way, you know, because she was with a man who would say such horrible, demeaning things to her in front of people. It was so bad that one time I looked at him and I said, You may think that by putting her down in front of me makes you seem better and her less, it makes you look like an asshole. And, um, but she stayed with him for 20 years because she didn't think she could get better, anyone better. Yeah. And, and that, that is the definition of settling. It's somebody, it, it is I, a miserable yeah. relationship. And there was no conversation that there, there's no starting point. Yeah. It's, that's what they created. Here's the thing that's interesting, Fawn. There is a risk that you will not find better. And we can't make that go away, right? So at that moment when I choose to leave a terrible situation or relationship, I have to face that risk because there, there's no guarantee. I might, and we'd all like to think, okay, you're definitely going to get better the next time. But we don't know. You could be alone the rest of your life. Who knows? Well, but let me let me chime in. As long as better... And one of the options of better is knowing that being alone and that you are enough, then you will get better, right? Sure. If you don't always yeah. have to have some 
I mean, it's like I'm I'm alone for the first time in my life for five years. The Whoa. best five years I ever had in my life. I am having Isn't that pets. something? Yeah. If I want a baked potato for dinner, that's what I eat. If I <laughs> go you know, girl. I want to ride my bike 10 miles or 50. It's on me. And I it's I love it. And so that was when I discovered that trading up might be just betting on me. That's right. Yeah. But again, I feel like people have to face that risk, right? Because they, in other words, they stay in a bad situation because it's like you said, because it's known. And they're sometimes genuinely terrified to take the risk of the unknown. And that right there is where I feel like they develop more emotional maturity. It's like, take the risk, right? To, for yourself, for your own sake, to, to, to give yourself a shot at something better, different, whatever. Like you are the steward of yourself. So why leave yourself, kind of abandon yourself in this terrible situation when all you have to do is face the risk that, you know, you may not find something that you want elsewhere. I had a, but this year, starting this year, so I do a, a a vision board every year for my birthday. Like, what is this year going to mean for me? Why? And kind of on this topic, uh, my theme was bet on me because oh. that was very different. You know, it was do, taking care of everybody. Do, and it yeah. was like, bet on me. I mean, I've made radical changes in thoughtful, not, yeah, you know, not, uh, but very intentional changes. And man, it is hard and it's terrifying. Yeah. And I'm so proud of myself. Right. I mean, like, I'm just so proud of myself. I'm like, I'm betting on me. I don't have all the answers. I don't. It's not all turning out like a thought. Um, Better and, you know, better and 2BD. But it was just that. And and so I appreciate what you're saying here um, to just. You, you're going to grow and you're going to get more mature and you're going to realize that you're more self-sufficient and capable than maybe you have given yourself credit for. And it's just yeah. more vital, isn't it? Don't you just feel more vitality it's regardless of heaven. what the external story is, right? Yes. It's yeah. like you move out of that tight space, it's just more vital. Yes. Yes. Been a Good beautiful. for you. <laughs> yeah. I, it's, you know, this is like my second book. This book is 20 years old. But there was this part where I was writing about this horrible thing that happened and I settled and stayed in a, a job where I was miserable and, and had a horrible boss. And so I tell this story and I go, life is so sweet when you take your power and use it for yourself. If you feel stuck, unstick yourself. Don't listen to your tormentors and don't torment yourself. You have the right to feel good about who you are, love what you do and do it well. When you think you are trapped in a bad relationship, you aren't. When you feel sure no one else will want you, they will. If the job is dragging you way down, move on. If you're scared you can't get a job elsewhere, you can. Would I have ever left that job if the tormentor hadn't been so cruel? I'd have missed out on the greatest adventure of my life, writing this. It's amazing. Every time you find yourself in a moment of self-definition, no matter how dark it is, you have the power to turn it into And for me, I mean, that's, you know, like, being in my 60s now, I'm I'm just turned 63. And and what's your biggest fear about, you know, if you leave a relationship, no one will allow me, I'm going to be alone. Okay, so your big fear when you're in your 60s about being alone is going to be, you're going to have a heart attack and die and you're going to be on the floor and nobody's going to find you. And, it, you know, I'm, I may have to have some more knee surgery and I'm supposed to have someone with me for two days and it's like who's going to do it and you don't want to ask and then I realized we've got this whole circle of women who are all in the same age group with that same fear and we're going to have a meeting now I said okay because I got someone's going to do it right but we're going to have a meeting where we make a pact that all of these things where we need someone for two nights in our house some one of us is going to do that and (laughs) so once you remove that fear then being alone is this limitless opportunity to find out who you are. And so I I just, you know, because I have settled in relationships before. And it's the relationship with myself is my favorite. Yeah, I think that's the thing that gets dropped out when we settle is the relationship with ourselves. I do think settling 
shuts down my relationship with myself because it's not, I'm not telling myself the truth. I'm saying this is okay when it's actually not. So right there, I cut off my relationship with myself. And I don't see people be happy when they do that, you know? Yeah. You have to have a pretty engaged, I think, sort of thriving relationship with self. I don't mean it all in an ego-driven way or egotistical way. I mean in a deeper way than that. Like I, I need to have my fingers on the pulse of what's true for me, what's important to me, what I'm reaching for. Like, and I, and I have to listen carefully to that, you know? Yeah, that's, but you know, what a great growth moment too. Great growth moment. And I do see people that take those opportunities they get more and more deeply connected to themselves and their lives change. I think because of that, not because of what they're doing outside, but because they're starting to listen and starting to tell the truth. And, you know, there's a phrase I really like, take a stand on the truth within. And I think that's such a beautiful uh, phrase. Yeah. One of, and one of my mentors used to say, it's, it's a matter of standing up inside yourself. And I love that because it's not about standing up to someone else. I stand up to the parts of me that have been keeping me small or, or keeping me settled in some situation that's not good for me. I stand up to those parts of myself. I stand up inside myself. And I think that's so beautiful because we so often yeah. frame it about standing up to the boss or the wife or husband that's awful or whatever. And it's like, no, no, I'm standing up to the part of me that's been keeping me small. So do you do that? Do you have to still work on that now, or are you all enlightened? Well, yeah, and because it, it, I mean, what the standing up entails gets more and more and more subtle, doesn't it? There's not an end point. It's not like, oh, I got it now. Because now there's the next place to stand up, right? And I'll do that, and then there's the next place. And I feel like that that's never going to stop. You know, just this past weekend, I was visiting a 101-year-old friend of mine back in Oklahoma, and... uh I watched her, you know, she's fading very fast, but I watched her sense of humor and her graciousness. And even in, you know, she's a little bit befuddled. She's like smiling and, and saying to me, now, honey, who are you? Like, I've known her for decades, you know, and I would tell her who I was and she would just light up. Oh, honey. And I thought, man, she's showing herself like she doesn't even have the energy to be trying to protect herself or putting on a face or anything like that. It's, uh, it's just terrific. Terrific. I, I have a very close friend who's, yeah, she's getting up there. She's in late seventies and her husband's in his eighties now. And her biggest fear is what's going to happen when he dies. Yeah. And, and I'm like, well, first you're making an assumption that he's going first because yeah. you don't know. And then I said, but here's the, here are the advantages when you're alone. Okay. You want cereal for dinner? I, I went through the whole thing. I said, if you're scared for your security, get a dog. I said, we're going through the whole thing. And then after we were done, she says, I, I needed that conversation. I didn't realize oh, yeah. that it was going to be that, you, you know, it, it, another moment to learn and grow. Yeah. Of we could talk because to it's first. easy to get scared and then back away. And it's like what you did with her is like, let's walk through it. Yeah. You know? Stop it. What we about could talk this? to you what forever. We, we love you. I got to let Michelle <laughs> um, wrap up. She's texting okay. me. You and I are at it. We're on a roll, Elizabeth. <laughs> it's so Go good. Ahead. You like, okay, you, you, we have a book of quotes from today's recording. Your... Like, I loved it. So here were a couple things that stood, stood out. I like um, just reminding us to have the courage to speak up and say the thing that needs to be said if you want to heal and move yourself into a better place. No. <laughs> And the more you say hard things, you hear hard things, the more skilled you will be at it. So when don't be afraid of screwing it up because you're still making positive progress. There, there are a lot more, but what I think the, the biggest reminder was um, what it was, it is about always tuning into your own intuition. And I loved when you wrapped it up with the, just take a stand on the truth within that is so powerful. Oh, and it yeah, had that was in the driver's seat. So what a gift you are. This was fabulous. <laughs> and and people I really are going to want to know that how to reach you, which is at uh, HaneyConsulting.net. But she spells it Heaney H Consulting. H E A N E Y. H E A 
neyconsulting.net and be careful with the dot net dot net yeah got it. so you're you're wonderful thank you so much for being thank with you. us and well we we certainly got our free hours worth of therapy thank i know i've got some work i've got some work to go do i'm going to try yeah. this uh not saying uh i'm fine i'm going to test this out yeah. <laughs> i'm fine yeah, everything's well, fine yeah and i'm sorry yeah all right yeah. love you both <laughs> goodbye Good Thank you so much. Thank you for joining the Hard Won Wisdom Podcast with best-selling author Fawn Germer and corporate innovator Michelle Brigman. Join us weekly for career and life-changing conversations with some of today's most influential thought leaders, senior executives, and trailblazers who will share their mentoring wisdom. This podcast is brought to you by the Women's Leadership Network. Visit hardwonwisdom.com for more on this podcast and for links to Fawn and Michelle's web pages and social media. Also, be sure to rate, subscribe, and review wherever you listen to your podcasts. We really appreciate that effort, and we'll see you next week.